Hi, my name is Lania Quinn Davidson, and I am the Area Fire Advisor for University of California Cooperative Extension in Humboldt County. And for this presentation, I'm going to be talking about options for prescribed fire on private lands, and then also delving into some of the myths around prescribed fire in California. And in my job as a Cooperative Extension Advisor, um, I've had a lot of interest over the last few years from private landowners who have wanted to bring prescribed fire back into their toolbox, or from the foresters they work with, or from other folks who are doing projects on private lands. And um, for a long time, I was just referring folks to CAL FIRE because that was the only option that seemed really reasonable at the time. Um, I didn't know of a lot of other great options for private landowners to just get prescribed fire back onto their properties. So I started looking into the various options that are actually available. I wanted to have more information to give landowners and more opportunity. And so this presentation presents four primary options that Jeff Stackhouse, my colleague, and I really pulled together um, when thinking about prescribed fire on private lands. The first of those is CAL FIRE's Vegetation Management Program. And um, this is a great program. It's basically CAL FIRE's private lands burning program. And through this program, CAL FIRE plans and implements from start to finish the, the burn. And so they come in and develop the burn plan. Um, they do a lot of the project prep. And often the, the landowner will do a small amount of of in-kind cost share, um, either through unit preparation or by providing lunch for the crews. Um, but that, even that's not required. It's I think it's preferred, but the, the cost to the landowner is very low for these vegetation management program burns. Um, CAL FIRE also provides all the crews and resources, deals with permits, and does all the environmental compliance work. Um, but the cons of the VMP are that there's really limited agency capacity to get the burns done. And often when we have the best burn windows in Northern California, Southern California is experiencing wildfire and CAL FIRE has to pull their crews to, you know, for fire suppression, um, or just politically they can't be prescribed burning when there's wildfire in another part of the state. Um, so there really is a limited capacity to get the projects done. Also, the, the environmental compliance requirements because of CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, um, really extend the planning horizon for these VMP burns and can often delay projects by many years. And, you know, in the end, VMP projects just really aren't guaranteed um, because of all of the, the competition that, that I just mentioned with, with both wildfire and with, um, you know, crew capacity and resources. Private contractors are another option that a lot of folks don't realize is a realistic option. There are private contractors, private companies in California um, that do prescribe fire, and there aren't many of them, but the ones that do exist are highly qualified, have crews and resources, and can, can really do a project from start to finish um, in, you know, in full, much like CAL FIRE does. But the, the main issue with a private contractor option, at least if you're doing like a full package for prescribed fire, is the cost. So if you're hiring a, a private crew to come in and plan the burn and then fully implement it and, you know, and even prep the unit, you're looking at a pretty extreme cost. And most landowners don't have the resources to, to spend that kind of money on a prescribed fire project. Now, it's important to remember that doing it yourself is an option. And as residents in California, as landowners in California, we do have the right to use prescribed fire on our properties. Um, of course, we have to adhere to permits and laws and regulations, um, but you really can, it is part of your toolbox and you are able to use prescribed fire on your property. The pros of doing it yourself is, you know, you do it on your own schedule, you're not waiting around for anyone to do it for you. Um, you can do it how you want, and it's low cost because it's mostly just your time and resources. Um, but the cons are you're still, you know, you're in charge of liability. Um, you're going to need to pull together the people, power, and resources that you need, and you may not have access to, you know, to the equipment and to the kinds of staffing that you would need to do the projects you would want. And then you still have to deal with all the permits and the air quality issues and things like that. So it can be a heavy lift for, for someone who um, doesn't have access to the, those kinds of resources. 
Now, one of the options that we've gotten increasingly excited about over the years is the prescribed burn association model. And um, this is a model that relies on neighbors helping neighbors, so community-based burning where people are getting together, volunteering, working together to plan and implement burns on each other's property. And the beauty of it is that it's like a prescribed fire collaborative, cooperative, right? So you help out someone and they're going to help you out. We liken it to a branding in the ranching culture where you know that if you help someone, that that's going to come back around to you. So that keeps the cost really low because it's volunteer based. People bring resources and equipment and, um, you know, labor can be pooled through this community collaborative. You can also um, become a nonprofit, get nonprofit status, and then apply for grants and funding. And you can make every burn a training opportunity for other community members so that you're always building capacity to do more in the future. So we learned about this model um, through some connections in the Great Plains and just found it to be a really promising way to bring prescribed fire back to private landowners and to give landowners some autonomy around that. The cons, of course, are that um, you're still dealing with liability, though you can hire a private burn boss to come in and lead burns, which is something we've done quite a bit in Humboldt County, and that helps with, you know, bringing insurance and giving you a little extra buffer. Um, cons, again, you have to deal with the permits and all the air quality stuff, um, and someone has to coordinate. So we're finding that with the prescribed burn association model, that can be a challenge, you know, who finding someone who can lead that effort and really take charge of it and bring people together to do the burning. And, you know, one of the ways that we really got interested in the Prescribed Burn Association model was through our connections with John Weir, who's an extension specialist in Oklahoma. So he has a similar position to mine, but he's based in Oklahoma. And he's kind of the godfather of Prescribed Burn Associations. He's been involved in the, the startup of many, many PBAs, we call them. And he did a survey um, back in 2015 that looked at 27 different PBAs um, in the Great Plains over a period of eight years. And he found that those 27 prescribed burn associations had conducted almost 1,100 burns and completed more than 470,000 acres of prescribed fire in just an eight year period. That is so impressive. Um, if you, you know, that's about as much prescribed fire as our, all of our agencies in Northern California combined would have been able to do in that same period. So it's really impressive because these are just private landowners working together and helping each other out. Um, all of those burns, you know, almost 1,100 burns, only one official report of injury, and it was a minor injury. And they had an escape rate that was similar to what we see with our, you know, our federal fire management agencies, um, but no insurance claims or lawsuits. So really impressive, these PBAs. And Jeff recorded a talk on prescribed burn associations as part of this workshop series. So you can learn more about what we've been doing up in Humboldt County. So this is just a summary slide that shows these four different options and kind of gives you a sense of how they compare with one another. So the vegetation management program, cost of landowner, very little. Success rate, variable. Um, when it works, it's awesome. And uh, when you're waiting for five years to get your burn done, it's not as awesome. So it's, you know, it, it can be variable. Great program, but not super reliable. Um, private contractor, super expensive, right? Success rate, probably pretty high. If you're able to shell out that kind of money to do a project, it's going to get done because those contractors are, are flexible and are going to prioritize it. Do it yourself pretty cheap. Um, if you're a landowner, it's your time, it's your labor. Success rate's probably pretty high, but probably at a pretty small scale. So if you have bigger projects, bigger acreages, um, you're going to be wanting to look at some other options. And the beauty of the Prescribed Burn Association model is that the cost is pretty low. And I think Jeff's talk covers some of the cost stuff that we've dealt with in Humboldt County. Um, but the success rate is really high because it's really about building local capacity to do prescribed fire and empowering landowners and their other community members to do the work themselves. Um, so that's just a helpful slide to think about how these different, these different options compare. So at this point in the presentation, you're probably thinking, well, this is all great. It's great we have options. Um, but there are so many reasons why this, why this won't work and why prescribed fire is hard to implement on private land. So 
let's break some of those those narratives down. Um, I like to call them myths, but I realize that's a little provocative. I think another way to think about it is to think of them as narratives around prescribed fire that we need to be aware of and that we need to um, deconstruct a little bit. So one of them is that I encounter all the time is this idea of um, only fire experts can conduct burns. In California and in the West in general, we have a real fire suppression culture. And we, we tend to think that only fire professionals are the ones who can use prescribed fire, that it's somehow housed under fire suppression. But let's not forget that the, the original users of prescribed fire, the, um, you know, the people who pioneered this practice throughout history were first Native Americans who, you know, really are the original artists of prescribed fire, and then ranchers later um, who use prescribed fire extensively across California. And so these were normal people. These were normal people who were using fire to manage their resources, their landscapes, their, their food resources. And um, these were not fire professionals. They were, they were everyday people using fire as, as part of their land management practice. Um, now, in the PBA context and, you know, in this current context of, of using prescribed fire, I would argue that you can really leverage the diverse skills of anyone in your community to help get prescribed fire done. Strong leadership is key on a burn. You want someone leading the burn who really understands fire behavior, who has, you know, quite a bit of experience in prescribed fire. Um, but from the PBA mindset, you can bring lots of different people in to support your prescribed burns, and they don't have to be fire experts. In our PBA, we have people who are ranch hands. We have people who are good welders and can work on the tools and equipment. We have older folks who can drive around and resupply drip torches and bring folks water. We have people who like to cook and make lunch, or people who like to take pictures, or people who are really good at radio programming. So there's a whole host of skills that you can leverage in a prescribed fire setting. And if we just had a bunch of people who are just good at fire, I think we'd actually be worse off because we, we need all those different skills. And we really are trying to rebuild the fire culture in California. And um, we need to remember that fire users don't have to be people who work exclusively in fire. Um, we need to bring it into our, our larger social and cultural um, ways of being in California. Another one we encounter a lot is this idea that we're in California and, you know, all the things they're doing out in Nebraska and Oklahoma are great, but California just has way more red tape and it's much harder to get this work done. And so I would push back on that. And I would tell you that in California, it, amazingly, there are only two permits that we need as private landowners to do prescribed fire on our projects and our properties. So year round, we need air quality permits and we always need to be working with our air quality staff to make sure that the correct permits are in place for that. Um, and then in some cases, depending on the size of your, your project and which district you're in, you might need a smoke management plan. And those two things kind of go hand in hand. So you can watch the smoke management plan um, presentations to get more sense of what that looks like. Now, during fire season, you're also going to need a CAL FIRE permit. This typically starts on May 1st and goes through the late fall. Um, the end of fire season depends on what's going on with fire season. So um, sometimes we'll see it at the end of October. Sometimes it's as late as December. Um, in some parts of the state, it's year round, though usually not in Northern California. So those are the only two permits that you need as a private landowner to do prescribed fire projects, which I think is surprising to some people. Now, another one that we hear a lot is that the public doesn't support prescribed fire. And it's all fine and great and, you know, fire's great, but at the end of the day, the public just doesn't support it. And again, this is one that's just not shown to be true. Um, in social science research, there's a lot of social science research to demonstrate that the public does support prescribed fire. Um, and that they really are starting to understand the role of fire on the landscape. So in California, Californians know that fire is important. They understand that we live in a fire adapted landscape. And, um, and they, they do support things like prescribed fire, but they kind of want to know who's doing it. And it's interesting, 
you know, I grew up in Trinity County, which is predominantly a federal landscape managed by the, the Forest Service. And it's true that in, in the town where I grew up in Hayfork, people were generally supportive of prescribed fire, but they had some trust issues with the Forest Service, and that was where things got sticky. And so it's interesting as we start thinking about community members doing prescribed fire, um, maybe some of those trust issues change a little bit because then people are seeing the community leading these efforts themselves and they're part of it. And I find with the PBAs that we're starting up across the state that um, it's been nice to see that trust and that investment that we often don't feel when we're looking at our federal agencies. And California is really ready. I mean, California has had so much challenge with fire over the last couple of years and people want a positive solution. So um, we need to stop saying that the public doesn't support it and we need to start telling the public that they do support it and um, and that they, you know, this is the way to to make us more fire resilient. The other interesting thing to think about in, in terms of California being different than other states is um, California actually has a ton more open space and wildlands than many other areas where more burning happens. So if you think about a place like Florida, which has the most burning of anywhere in the country, I mean, they do more than 2 million acres a year of prescribed fire compared with our you know, 50,000 acres a year in Northern California. Um, they have people and houses and towns and roads mixed in everywhere. I mean, Florida has a lot of wildland urban interface and they are burning right up against homes, right up against schools, right next to highways. They're just burning all over the place. Um, and so they actually recognize the wild and urban interface issues as bigger problem for them than we do in California. If you survey fire managers in California, they're not going to note those as their biggest issues. So it's pretty interesting. Like the public issues are, are the public interface is more severe in some of these states where they're doing way more burning than we are. Now, this is one I hear all the time, that uh, California is too complex. It's not like Nebraska or Texas or Florida. Those places are flat. Those places are dealing with different issues. And I would argue that there is a lot of California that looks a lot like Nebraska, Texas, and Florida as far as, um, you know, big, lo like, low topography kind of rolling hills, grassy woodlands um, that are pretty low-hanging fruit for prescribed fire. And I know with the audience for this presentation, it's a lot of um, people who are dealing with forested lands. And even in the forested lands, I think we have some, some low hanging fruit, some beautiful ponderosa pine stands that could really benefit from prescribed fire, um, you know, mixed conifer area. Like we have a lot of, of area that is perfectly suitable for bringing prescribed fire into. And then we have more complex areas too. And we have strategies for dealing with those. But let's stop saying that California is just one way, because we know it's not. We have some of the most diverse ecosystems um, in, in the country, and we have a lot of low-hanging fruit from a fire perspective. And then the last one that I'm not going to go into in too much detail because there's another presentation that I'm giving on this topic is liability. And, um, and so the one thing I just want to kind of preface the other talk with is just saying that there are different categories of liability law in the United States. There are three main ones. Um, strict liability, which means you're liable no matter what happens. So if your burn escapes and you cause damages, then you are responsible, even if you did everything right. There's simple negligence, where you're going to be liable if you're proven to have been negligent. And then there's gross negligence, which is where you have to have been found to be grossly negligent, like super careless in order to be held liable. So that's like states like Florida, Georgia, a lot of the southeastern states have gross negligence laws. We in California have a simple negligence law. And that's actually pretty great for prescribed fire. Um, it's not, you know, if we had a strict liability law, that makes it a lot harder. It's a lot less conducive to prescribed fire. But simple negligence gives us some protection. And it means that if we're doing you know, a good job planning projects, adhering to our burn plans. We're, we're taking all the measures that we can to, to do this work safely, which we should be doing. That's how we should be operating. Then we've got some protection under our state law. And so I'll, I'll dig into to more of that in the liability presentation. Please check that out. And I'll actually dig into some case, you know, specific cases 
um, where we can start to dissect what is being negligent look like and how can we not be that way. So please do check out that presentation on liability. But the final thoughts for this presentation, I think the most important thing that I've realized over the last 10 years working on prescribed fire is that it's so important for private landowners to know the laws and regulations and to know the options and to not feel like there, there's only one option for getting prescribed fire done um, or to be misinformed on the regulations to the point where they feel you know, like the liability is just a deal breaker for them or that there are too many permits or that the public doesn't support it. Um, we need to know the reality of the situation, and it gives us a lot more autonomy and, um, and kind of empowers us to actually use prescribed fire. And let's find reasons to say yes. I think this is so important. It is so easy to say no. Um, I, I, I'm good friends with a, um, a former CAL FIRE unit chief, and what he'd always say is, Lania, we can find a reason not to burn any day. Even on the most perfect day, we can find a reason not to do it. But we need to focus on finding the reasons to do it. And I think that's right. I think it's really easy to say no and to cite all these reasons why we can't do it. But the bolder people will find reasons to say yes. And lastly, everyone can have a role. So if you're not a fire expert, that's okay. Um, call me up. We'll find a way to, to get you involved and get you some experience and get you more connected with fire. So um, please shoot me an email if you have questions about this or need more information. And uh, thanks so much for being part of this workshop.